Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Well, today, today is, um, well, it's, it may be the grand finale of the series, but it won't be the grand finale of our conversation at Elevate Church. But I wanted to end um, this series with the discussion of the fear of the Lord. Let me say the fear of the Lord. So we talked about all the toxic fears that the enemy does or uses to trip us up. And, um, and I did this on purpose. You know, normally in a series, you would want to start with the foundation of the fear of the Lord and then get into all the stuff. But I wanted to do a flip on us and start with all the fears and then come back and let's really talk about the foundation in order for us to get the victory of some fears that we've been holding on to for too long or, or fears that have been gripping you for too long or fears that have been paralyzing you with toxicity. And I really believe today as we get a better understanding of what the fear of the Lord is, I really believe that we're going to begin, begin to, to claim back some ground that the enemy has taken from us. How many are ready to take back what belongs to you? Amen? All right, okay, but let me ask you, let me, let's just start with this. How many here believe that working out has its benefits? Like working out, going to the gym, working out. Um, yeah, lift your hand if you believe that. I mean, as we're getting closer to the, the, you know, the new year, you know that's your first New Year's resolution. You know how that works, right? But what are some benefits of working out? Let's just throw some out. Work with me. I'm sorry, you lose weight. What else? You get more strength. More muscle. More healthy. How about that? Huh? It relieves so that there's less stress. That's, that's a great benefit there. What else? Come on. Cardiovascular. You feel more confident, right? You, got, you walk out of the gym, you start walking like you're buff, right? And you know you ain't buff. You're just sticks. But, but there's this confidence level when you walk in out of the gym. You know what I'm saying? That goes for ladies too, right? What else? What else? Huh? Low, lower blood pressure. Come on. That's good. Huh? How about no diabetes? Huh? I mean, there's so many amazing benefits to working out that you and I have available to us every single day. How about more stability when you work out, right? You're a little bit more stable. You're, you're more grounded. You feel like, man, I'm strong. Or you, you, how, how about a longer life? Wouldn't that be a great benefit? You know that God promises 120 years to us? And the only reason that we don't live up to 120 or it's rare that someone lives even to 100 years old is because we don't have a healthy lifestyle. So there's many wonderful benefits when it comes to working out. And that's cool. I love it. We should work out. We should keep writing that on the New Year's resolution every year. It would be a good idea. But let me talk to you about the workout that God wants us to work out. It's the foundational workout. It's the most important workout. And it's in Philippians 2.12. Read with me. If you have the app, download the notes. It says work out. Let me say work out. Just when you thought the world came up with that phrase, huh? God came up with the phrase, work out your husband's salvation. <laughs> Ladies, work out your wife's salvation. <coughs> work out your son's salvation. Work out your daughter, your cousin, your uncle, your co-workers, your pastors. Your... No, it says work out your what? Own salvation. You know why? Because we live in a culture where we're more focused on what everyone else is doing that we forget about our own salvation. We're so focused on, about everyone's flaws and sins and, and their mess-ups and their dis, disgusts and everything you can think of about another person. But God's saying, hey, listen, you know what? Before you start looking at someone else, I want you to work out your own salvation with faith. Fear, it would say fear, and what? Trembling. And so what is, what is salvation? I think most Christians, if you were to ask them, honestly, even here, if I were to ask you, what is salvation? What were you saved from? What do you mean salvation? 
What do you mean work out my salvation? Here's what he's saying. Salvation simply means this. It means deliverance from harm, deliverance from ruin, restoration, redemption. So he's saying work out your preservation. Work out the fact that God delivered you from harm, that God delivered you from ruin, that God delivered you from destruction. He said, work that out. Notice that salvation was free, but keeping it is work. Oh, I'm talking to the wrong crowd this morning. At the 80 and everyone was like, amen, hallelujah, glory to Jesus. No, no, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. With fear, but say with fear and trembling. I believe that the greatest foundation, I, I think that the number one fear that we should put all our attention to is the fear of the Lord. I, I really believe like that's where it all starts. Maybe, maybe you're here today and, and in the last few weeks have we, as we've been discussing the different fears, there's, there's fear of failure. There's the fear of success. There's the fear of, uh, of doubt. There's the fear of belief. There's all these different fears that we hit in the last few weeks. And, and I know that as you've been hopefully processing and assessing and addressing in order for you to progress you've been thinking about how am I going to break up with fear if you have not done that then that just shows you the state of where we're in remember Satan was talking last weekend on the video y'all remember that if you weren't here go watch it uh, but but I'm telling you the enemy knows how to trip us up the enemy knows how to paralyze us he knows how to stop us from, from walking out God's divine path. He knows how to keep you from ever coming to a place called straight and the narrow. Broad is the way and many go through it. Narrow is the way and few go through it. And so the enemy knows how to work us when it comes to this issue of fear. But he says, work out your own salvation. Everybody say my own. Come on, set your eyes on you. Like, stop trying to fix everybody else when you haven't fixed you yet. And he says, with fear, so you work it out with fear. Fear of what? Fear that God is watching me. Okay? So our first emotion, everybody say first emotion, should be the fear of God. That should be my first emotion. The very first emotion that I wake up with every day is like, man, I fear the Lord. I better pray before I leave this house. Huh? Like, I better, I better at least spend 10 minutes of reading the scripture today because I fear the Lord. I, 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 I fear. And when we, when, we, when we hear this word tremble, I know that our, our natural mindset is someone like, like, that's trembling. like. Ah. But, but if, if, if you really want to understand what tremble means, it, it simply means to have a reverence. For example, when you think about the book of Revelations, when John was writing the account of his experience with God, with his experience with Jesus. John wrote in the scriptures of Revelations, he said, and when he saw the Lord, he couldn't even face him. He couldn't even look at his face because his face was shining as bright as the sun, just piercing through. And he just couldn't, and he started trembling. And he started getting on the floor and just reverencing God and saying, oh my God, I'm not worthy. I'm not holy enough. I'm not good enough. And how many know that none of us deserve it? None of us are worth it. None of us should have it, but God's grace and love is awesome. That's tremble. We don't have tremble anymore. Heck, we barely have people on time to worship. We waltz into church like, like it's whatever. He says, I want you to work out your salvation. This, do, you, do you realize that coming to church is like your spiritual gym? You get a workout, right? And it hurts. Because, listen, nobody wants to hear a message on the fear of the Lord, right? We want to hear another message on love. And I get it. Love is awesome. We live in a culture in church. Okay, let's talk church, not, not, not the world. We already know the world is just absent from wanting to know God. We get that. It's separated, whatever. But just the church. We just want to hear love, grace, mercy. And we like that because it makes us feel better about our sin, it makes us feel better about how we live. It makes us feel better about our choices. Because if we hear another message of love and mercy and grace, then we're, we're okay. But there is a, a lopsided church today that we, that we attend. There's a lopsided church, body of Christ, 
in the world that just focuses all on the love of God and not the consequence of God. There is a healthy, balanced diet with God. You can't even begin to know love until you finally understand the fear of God. And you'll never know the fear of God until you know the love of God. And so there's an unbalance when we don't know the fear of God and the love of God. You know, when Isaac was little, they were, I can say both my kids, I was, I, I was bad. But I can say, you know, they're a little crazy, you know, my kids. Isaac and Alexis were and have been really obedient kids. And I love that about them. You know what I'm saying? Um, I wasn't like that. But, you know, my kids growing up, they were very respectful, very, oh, here's my other one right here. <laughs> got a, I got one there and one here. And, and, you know, they've always been very respectful. I've always set a standard, like, in the Ruiz family, we'll love God, love people, you won't lie, blah, blah, blah. And, and we've had all these things. And they, and they lived up to it. And, and, and I'm, sure, um, I'm sure that they had a sense of, well, I love Dad, so I want to honor Dad, and I want to honor Mom. But on the other flip side, they also knew the cincho. <laughs> you know, the belt. <laughs> right? Yeah. In, in my house, it was the chancla. Yeah, my mom, man, my mom can, man, she can throw a sandal like nobody. I mean, it was like a boomer. It cut corners, man. I'm not kidding you. Man, if you're, if you're a Hispanic mom out there, you know, you know who you are. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I, I grew up. And so, so man, I didn't, I didn't have the fear of the laws. Man, I had the fear of the chancla. But there's a difference when, when you have children that were raised up differently that they didn't just, they, didn't, they weren't afraid of me spanking them even though I disciplined them, right? Uh, and, and I think that's where we get confused when we talk about, you know, God's love and God's consequence. We think God as a punishing God, but God is not a punishing God. God is a disciplinary. He's a disciplinary. Punishment is Satan for the sin that we commit. Discipline is what God does because he loves you. And out of that love comes that reverence that you're just so thankful that he, listen, the only reason we stay in sin is because there's no lightning bolts being thrown out of heaven and hitting us. That's the only reason. So we continue to stay, do, we, we keep doing what we do, we keep living what we live, we keep talking the way we talk because nothing's happening, we're good. But how many know that every single one of us are an open book before God? And you and I will give an account for every single word, every single action, everything you and I have done. And you know what? And you can't blame it on your father, your mother, your cousin, your sister, your spouse, because he said you work out your own salvation with fear and so So until we get the fear of God... We're not going to get free like the beautiful, wonderful spoken word. I think there's a sense of false freedom but not true freedom. I think there's a false freedom when all you do is focus your life on grace, mercy, and, 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 and God's goodness and faithfulness. I think, there, I, I think that, that can be false freedom. True freedom is knowing the fear of the Lord while you still understand the grace of the Lord. Are you, are you here this morning? Okay. Is this, is this getting through? Let me give you a definition of the fear of God. Because it's funny how we, we seem to fear everything but God in our culture. We, we fear every, like we, we fear spiders. We, feel, we fear success. We fear failure. We fear, we fear all kinds of stuff. Uh, procrastination, all these, that we fear all these, but, but it's amazing how we won't fear God. Look, look, at, look at this. The fear of God is this. It's the 24-7, everybody say 24-7, 360-degree awareness that everything we do, say, think is before God daily, every day. It's kind of like Google Earth. Have you guys ever seen Google Earth? Google, man, it's so awesome. Just looking at it is awesome. You know, you can look at any part of the world. If you're someone like, man, I can't afford to go on vacation, just, just download Google Earth. <laughs> and so I was out in space this morning, and I said, I wonder, I wonder what our church, you know, travel through God's eyes looks like. And so watch this. This is what it looks like. This is God. He's a 360. Look at that. Ooh. Ooh. Whoa. Look at that. 
And then he's 360. Come on, look at that. He's 360, baby. Come on. That's how our God is. And then, boom, and then he zooms in. And see a little red dot? That's you in church right now. That's, that's you and I. Aren't you? Listen, God, God is a 24-7 and 360 God who, who not only, which we already know these sermons and we already know these messages. I preach them here too. He loves you. He protects you. He heals you. He delivers you. And everyone's like, yes and amen. Yeah, okay, awesome. Yeah, but God will discipline you. He'll correct you. He'll rebuke you. He'll call you out. He won't expose you, but he'll expose you in front of his presence. He'll convict you. He'll challenge you. He'll speak to you. How about that God? Do you know that God? <laughs> it's the same God, but he's a daddy, and he's a 24-7. And so what is, what is the fear of God? It's, it's having the revelation that whenever I speak an idle word, I'm going to give account for that word. Like when God tells you to do something, you're like, I could never do that, idol. I could never afford that, idol. Now, I'm not talking be goofy like, I'm going to own that big mansion, but you don't got a J-O-B. I, I get, that's, that's, that's goofy. But I'm telling some of you, listen, some of you, you know what God's called you to do. You, you know, you've heard clearly from God what you're supposed to do. But there's this fear that grips you of the unknown. So the unknown keeps you idle in worshiping your fear rather than the fear of God. Are you here? And so it's, it's like Google. Look at Psalms 103.11 says this. And I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back with, look at this, Google Earth. Look, look what God says. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his what? Love for those who so how many want some big love then fear God oh no I just want his love okay well God says you're going to experience this love when you fear me the reason perfect love has not cast out all fear is because you don't know this love well why do I know this why don't I know this love because you don't know you don't know the fear of God You've heard of the fear of God, but you have yet to experience the fear of God for some of us. And that's the only way that we'll even ever know the path of God. Think about it. You think God is going to give you the, the, the calling, the divine path for his purpose if, if we can't respect the one who's giving it to us? Let's be, let's be honest. Can we, can we just stay right there? That's why so many stay comfortable with what they do for the rest of their life because they think that's it. That's all they were born for. And that's not true. Listen, I grew up in the hood. I grew up in gang-infested neighborhoods, drug-infested, prostitution-infested, abuse-infested, all kinds of infestations. And let me tell you something. And God says, I will choose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So we have no excuse. Well, what about me, Pastor? I grew up with a silver spoon in Beverly Hills. You're awesome too. That, hey, man, you're blessed. That's awesome. But where's the fear of God in that too? So it's not just for the guy that's the down and outer. How about the up and outers? How about the ones, man, you got a nice house. You got a nice car. Man, you got not only enough for your mortgage, you got enough for five mortgages. Well, you also require the fear of the Lord. The Bible says, and what does the Lord require of you? The fear of the Lord your God, to walk in the path of his ways. And that is his requirement for every single one of us. So we can't even begin to address any of the fears that I talked about in the last three weeks until we address the foundation. And the foundation is that every single one of you, Isaac, you got to have the fear of God. Alexis, you got to have the fear of God. Outside of that, these are my kids. I love them. I'm not a perfect dad. You're not a perfect parent. You're not a perfect person. But we have a God who perfects all of our concerns. And he is perfect in all his ways. And our job is to get to that place where we just allow God's love, but, but, but also the fear of God that we have for him to get us to change. Amen. Sam, an open book. 
and I'm going to have to give an account. Dang, say that again because that, that, that hurt right there, right? <laughs> say it again because some of you are like, you, you guys just, you didn't like the latter part. You just said, I'm an open book. <laughs> Do y'all see that? Some people are just like, they just lowered their voice. Say it again. I'm an open book. And I will give account. Yeah. Doesn't that feel so much worse? No, I'm just kidding. All right, here's another acronym for fear. Ready? Fear is foundation or foundational emotions always reverent. Foundational emotions always reverent. Foundational emotions always reverent. Foundational emo. Our first emotion should be the fear of God and not the fear of everything else. Our first, because we're a ball of emotions, aren't we? Every single one of us. Right now, too. You're feeling something right now. You're either feeling, you know, the, the love of God or you're feeling like, Oh, uh, there's, that, there's that, that fire and brimstone preaching. Now, you know what? That's the problem. You know what? We keep blaming the fire and brimstone preaching of back in your day that got you all soured puss today. And now you're just trying to look for something easier because we want a convenient gospel and not a confrontational gospel. Because a convenient gospel will basically be a gospel that you created that fits your lifestyle. And so we just start living a convenient gospel. And we twist the gospel and, and we play with the gospel. And, and tell me how that works for all of us here. And we have all have been guilty of it. Every single one of us have gone to that place where we have taken the foundation that God has given us. And that we are to live and walk by and we've twisted it. Look at what Proverbs 9, 10. We read this the first week. Let's read it again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I'll say it this way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of a relationship with God. The fear of the, of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and, look, look what else. And it's the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding and the knowledge, everybody say, and the knowledge and the knowing of the Holy One, knowing Jesus personally, not knowing Jesus through a podcast, not knowing Jesus through a sermon, not knowing Jesus through your pastor, not knowing Jesus through your mommy, your daddy, your grandparent, no, and knowing the Holy One is understanding. We wonder why so many in the body of Christ don't understand. Why are we going through all this? Why? Because you don't understand the fear of the Lord. I'll ex I'll, let me show you why. Here's another verse. Look at this one. Isaiah 33, 6 says this. Wisdom and knowledge. Everybody say it again. Wisdom and knowledge. Okay. So we know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom and what? Knowledge. Okay. Now Isaiah the prophet says, wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord, right? will be the stability of your times. Will be the what? The stability. When you have an unstable person, the only reason people are unstable in their walk with God, in their emotions, in their faith, in their trust, is because they have not learned how to develop a healthy fear of God. When you develop a healthy fear of God, the Bible says right here that even in times of instability, God will be your stability. Let's talk about recession. They keep talking about recession, 2019, recession, 2019, 2019 recession. You know what that does to people when you start hearing recession? You start, what do they do? They pull back. That's why the stock market starts getting a little bit, you know, fragile. That's why people don't spend as much. Why? Because people start talking about recession on the news. So what happens? Fear grips us again. Why? We've already experienced recession. Who wants to go through recession again? Let me see all your hands. No, nobody does. You know, I lost money during recession. Investments, I lost. It didn't feel good. It hurt. And so what happens? We can't look to the future when we keep experiencing the past, so we start hearing a word like recession, we hold back. 
And that's what happens with us. We never conquer fear because we keep holding back based on the experience we had in our past. And we can't move, or to, move forward to a future that God has for us. And then we just start play, playing the blame game. And God says, no, listen, I said, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then we can see some fruit. And don't get me wrong. I'm not going to tell you that when I hear things like that, that I don't get nervous. Being a pastor of this church is heavy financial pressure. <laughs> heavy. Not just here. I got financial home pressure and I got financial home pressure. The house and my house. Pressure. You know why? Because people around the world like children are depending on Elevate Church to supply the need. Why? Because this building, though it's awesome and we've been blessed and God has been good, it demands the lights to be paid every single month faithfully. Yeah. And there, have you noticed that the bills are faithful? Always. Man, bills are more, they're more faithful than most Christians. <laughs> like that thing shows up every day, every month, on time. On time. Christians, you just never know when they're going to show up again. Like, hey, good to see you. Three months later, hey, Pastor, I'm back. Where have you been? Just been rough. Oh, okay. It's, it, have you noticed? Don't have a spiritual recession anymore. Let's stop this spiritual recession. One moment you're all in, next moment you're kind of half in. No more spiritual recession. We're all in, period. Are we here? So he says, so wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of, their, uh, of your times and the strength of what? Oh, and the strength of what? Salvation. What's going to be your strength? The fear of God. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. I wonder what treasure you and I have yet to unlock because we have yet to understand the fear of God. I wonder what treasure is waiting for you right now. I wonder what's in God's treasure. Not that God's been withholding it, but he's been like, hey, uh, I got the key. <laughs> I'm just looking for a little respect. Hey, I got the key. I'm just looking for a little. Isn't it funny how, how we hear in our culture today, Jesus is my homie. <laughs> or he, you know, man, he, he's, he's my friend. <laughs> but, and I get it. Uh, but let's not get it twisted. Jesus said, I now call you friend. <laughs> Why? Why do he say it like that? Because he knows that we're unfaithful. But he says, I'll call you friend because I'll never leave you nor forsake you. How many of us have left God or forsook God? Lift your hand. Oh, all of us have. I know some of you are like half a hand. Hey, put that whole thing, you put that thing up. Like, yeah, that. <laughs> Last week, Pastor, that was me. No, no. Jesus said, hey, listen, the definition of your friendship and the definition of my friendship are two completely different definitions. God says, man, I'll be with you when you're in your deepest, darkest sin, and I'll be with you when you're standing on the mountaintop of righteousness. God says, I'll never leave you when you're at your lowest point. When everybody leaves you, I'll still be right there with you. That's, that's, see, that's a friend. But we treat him like homie. But haven't you noticed, too, that some of us here, we've had all these friendships, these friends. And I have always teach this to our worship team because, you know what, the, 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 the platform that the enemy always wants to attack is the worship team. It's, it just works like that. And I always tell him, like, you know what, you better guard the temptation to dishonor each other. Because the temptation to not respect each other, not love each other, not serve each other. Because when you first met, it was like, oh, my God. Oh, Kaziah, you're so awesome. Oh, my God, you're a bet. Ooh, she's so awesome. Yay, Kaziah, Kaziah. Right? But after a while, you get to know Kaziah. And it's just Kaziah. <laughs> hey, Kaziah, okay, just grab the mic. There's a chair. Go, go figure it. Go get the box yourself. You know, it's like we lose this reverence. We lose this respect. We lose this honor. But I see it in the church all the time. Like, there was a moment where it was very respectful, and now it's like kind of you just give people the cold shoulder. You know, or, or you walk as if people are invisible, but they're standing right there. Come on, Christians. You see that with Christians all the time. You know what? I, I, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. 
most often I get more love from people in the world than people in the church. I'm not kidding you. I meet the nicest people, and I'm thinking for, for sure they're Christians. And we'll be at restaurants, like, like damn, they, they got to be Christians. Yeah, I think they're Christians, and they're got to be. And they find out they're like, hell no, they're, they're, they're atheists. I'm like, oh my God, they're atheists. Good Lord Jesus, can you come speak at our church? Because <laughs> I think they need to get saved or something. I don't. It's just it's it. Christians are are mean. They'll talk about you. They'll bite you. You know, they'll love you one moment, then they'll bite you the next moment. Yes or no? It's, it's hilarious. There's no such thing as friend anymore. You know why? Because we treat God the way we treat our friends. There's lack of faithfulness, lack of loyalty. There's constant spiritual divorce that happens with God. Because there's constant divorce in the church, not only in marriage, but also in friendships. Okay, let's keep reading. Some of you look a little mad at me. That's okay. That's all right. I got an atheist friend out there somewhere. Hey, but it's one, I've, I've led more atheists to Jesus. I've led so many atheist people to Jesus. I have. It's been amazing. So many atheist people to Jesus. They're awesome. I love them. And I just think, I'm like, dang, if they only, had, if they only knew Jesus, like, wow. <laughs> okay, for sake of time, I got to hurry up. <sighs> All right, I'm going to end with this. We have to understand that part of the fear of God, the wisdom of God, Knowledge of God is being the witness of God. Because people can't ever know the fear of God until they witness it first. They, they can't even begin to respect God until they see someone who respects God. The problem we have in our culture, once again, is that we don't treat him as a holy God. We treat him as a Santa God. And so we got a lot of angry Christians in the church. I'm mad at God. Why are you mad at God? Well, man, I thought that by this I might have like 10 children. Like, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. I, th I thought that by this time my career would have, he promised me my career would have taken off. I, I, it's like Santa God. Like, it's like we treat God like, like the genie. Hey, God, this is what I want. It almost looks like crabs, huh? Right? God. <laughs> and if he don't do it, we drop him. Right? And many of us have been in a place maybe where you've been mad at God. Maybe someone died too soon and you're mad at God. Why'd you let that happen? Come on, can we be a little bit more spiritually mature and ask, ask ourselves the bigger question? I wonder what that person may have, maybe they didn't take care of them. I don't know. There's many. We can't just blame God for everything. You can't do that. That is unhealthy. That is, that is the, the, the devil will pervert the reverence when you start blaming him for your own emotions that you have created. Because you allowed the spirit of fear who comes to torment you. He comes to steal, kill, destroy. And then we slap God's name on that and we blame it on him. I have moments, I've had moments where I was disappointed. And I had a moment where I was angry. Like I can't believe I prayed God. And, 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 and we're talking, I'm not talking about like, oh God, I prayed to sell my house. I'm not talking, I'm talking about literally when my niece was killed. When she was breathing her last breaths and I hit my knees in fear and trembling and my niece died a minute later. I'm talking about that kind of stuff. Where I can say, God, where were you, man? I believed you. I quoted your word. I, I trusted you. That can get someone mad. Maybe you had a child that passed away. Maybe you had a miscarriage. 
Maybe you've had a horrible divorce and you're mad at, you're blaming God for it. You know, it's, that's not healthy fear. That's toxic. And it'll kill you spiritually and eventually emotionally and maybe even physically. Because stress kills, doesn't it? It kills. Stress is real. And Satan is the only one who brings stress. God is the one who brings peace that surpasses all understanding. But the only way to receive the peace that surpasses all understanding is to finally give up the right to understand. And then peace will fill you. I had to give up the right to understand. Why did she die? Once I, now listen, God doesn't require to give an answer, but I do require him to give me peace. You don't, have to, you don't have to answer, but give me peace concerning the problem. And God says, I got you there. <laughs> See, because that's a promise. He didn't promise he'll answer you. He said, I promise that I'll give you peace. We want answers. Why did you let that happen? You'll ask the rest of your life. You'll be 99 years old, 120. <laughs> Man, dentures falling on everything. Why would you let? God's going God's to be like, hey, listen. I'm the God of peace that surpasses all understanding. You want to keep trying to understand. Give up the right to understand and you'll just receive peace and peace will be more than enough. That's for somebody right there. Amen. Write this point down. We need to learn the fear of God before we could ever appreciate the grace of God. We need to learn the fear of God before we could ever appreciate the grace of God. Have you noticed that more and more in, 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 in our culture of church, all we hear is grace, grace, love, love, mercy, mercy. And I love all those things. We preach those here. And they're important. But it's almost like people just stay and they live in the grace, grace, love, love, mercy, mercy. And we stay dysfunctional. But when we learn the fear of God, you learn to appreciate the grace of God. Because now you'll realize that when you and I were in a place in our life, in a moment in our life, in the experience of our life where we couldn't, but grace showed up, grace stepped in, grace covered you. Then you appreciate it because out of a reverence and a fear of God that you say, thank you, God, I can take it from here now. But there's too many Christians living from grace to grace to grace. I was grace, grace, grace. His mercy is good. But that's, you've been saying the same thing for like the last 12 months. Grace. He graces me. He graces me. You know what? That's just a cover up for sin. Tell you, have, you ever, have you ever been in bed at night and you wake up 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., I don't care what time. And you start having a conversation in your head, and it can be something like this, like, I mean, listen, I've been hated for eight years in this community, off and on, people from our church, people from outside, just, you know, Christians. Family through a night. Not one attack was from worldly people. All of them were from Christians. All of them. Not one secular Ungodly person cursed me, but Christians did. So I've been hurt a lot. But have you ever been in bed where God just speaks to you and he whispers? And he'll say something like, Mauricio, let it go. Forgive so and so. But God, but you don't. But what if they do it again? But what if I. I give them forgiveness and, and they use it against me. That's how we all think, right? And, and so you've laid there and you're just like, okay. And you come to that conclusion, most of us, you just say, okay, God, I'm going to forget. I'm going to. You know how you treat your enemies? True repentance and forgiveness is when you can go buy your enemy a gift. What do you got? Uh, just a little sum for you. That's like pouring hot coals on their head because they're just like, what the? 
she done lost her mind, he lost his mind. You know what it does? Love cast out all fear because that person is also in a spirit of fear. That's why they keep rebelling. And so we're the only love that people can see. And so Abraham's laying in bed. Read it, Genesis 22. I'm out of time. Genesis 22. He's laying his bed, just laying there. And he wakes up in the middle of the night because he hears the voice of God. And God says to him, Abraham. And you know, you don't have to hear the voice of God. You can have the impression of God in the middle of the night. Because Satan will never tell you to forgive. He'll never tell you to give. He'll never tell you to serve. He'll never tell you to help. He'll never tell you to wake up, go to church. You know, many of us, we turn, that's the devil. Just turn the covers on. <laughs> and so he's, he's in bed and he hears the voice of God and he says, God says to Abraham, he says, Abraham, he said, give up your son. And Abraham was like, but I've been waiting for this son all my life. I've been waiting for Isaac all these years. And now you're asking me to give him up? And I know that some of us sometimes we feel this way because what is God asking you or what, God ha what has God asked you to give up that you have yet to give up? Maybe God's asked you to give up that bad attitude. Give up that anger. Give up that rage. Give up that, that, that lack of forgiveness. Give it up. And notice, he wasn't asking just to give it up. He was asking him to give it to him. And we know that Abraham in his obedience woke up Isaac early in the morning. Isaac, let's go. Isaac, okay, let's, where are we going, Dad? Don't worry about it, son, come. And we know that God asked him to sacrifice him. And he takes him and he's about to offer his son as a sacrifice. He's got the knife and ready to. And God said, stop. Why would God do that? Because God will always test your fear. I'll say it this way. God will always test your obedience. Keep reading Genesis 22. And God said, to Abraham after he was ready and willing to offer up and give up his son he said this he said now I know that Abraham truly fears me until you've been until you've been tested to give up something you'll never know how you fear God what is God asking you to give up what is he asking you to give up what addiction is he asking you to give up it could be alcohol. Give it up. It could be drugs. Give it up. Marijuana is not a drug. It was born in the earth. Praise God. Stop it. Stop it. He said be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He didn't say be under the influence of the herb. You See? Convenience gospel. It's the earth. It's organic. Praise God. No, stop it. It's, it's convenience. We, we twist it. We twist it so that it fits our lifestyle. That's what we do. Oh, it just, it just makes me feel better. No, you're tipsy. No, wine's okay. It's just don't drink liquor. Yeah, but, man, I can barely have a conversation with you. If you call that tipsy, I wonder what drunk looks like. No, seriously, yes or no? So, listen, you may have the addiction of pornography. You may have the addiction of, of lying. What are you willing to give up? 1 Peter 1.17 says this, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent what? Fear. In reverent what? But you're what? What did he call you and I? Foreigners. Say it, foreigner. Think about it. Foreigners? Foreigners are... Have you ever traveled out of the country? It's funny how, like, in our country... We're so comfortable that, like, when I go on trails, which don't do this, please. 
It just shows you I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working on my salvation. But I always walk on the paths that say, do not cross. And this, I've been like that since I was a kid. I just, I just do stuff that just, and, and I've been lost in the mountains as well in the past. Praise God. He, Lord brought me back. I learned my lesson. So now I don't do that. I was lost with my dog. I told my dog, if we don't make it, I'm eating you. It was funny. It was hilarious. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I, honest to God before God's presence, I got lost for two hours in the mountains. And stupid me. Stupid. Stu Anyways. Um, don't quote that. Don't call yourself. That was, no, that was stupid. Don't do that. And so anyways, but in our country, when you, when you feel comfortable, you just kind of like, ah, I got this, right? But when you travel to another country, have you noticed that, man, those laws scare you? Because you don't know, like, if I park, like in Italy, if you park in certain places where you're not supposed to park, they not only take your car, they arrest you. So you know you're like, okay, you can't park. No, don't park there. Just think, you're, you're in a different country. You're a foreigner. Man, you're, you're, you're an abiding lawful citizen. You don't want to screw it up because you don't want to be in, a, especially in the jail in Mexico. You know what I'm saying? You do not want to be in a jail in Mexico. You do not want to be in a jail in India. You do not want to be in a jail in Cambodia or Vietnam or any of these countries where, man, it's just, so you know what we do? Oh, man, we walk the fine line. That's what Peter's saying. Put that verse back up. Please leave it up. That's what Peter's saying. He says, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. We got to stop being so comfortable with our Christian walk. And remind ourselves... I'm a foreigner on this earth. I'm only passing by. Some of us have already pitched the tent on earth as if this earth is going to live forever. This earth is going to perish. This is not your country. This is not your world. Our world, our country, our soul, it will perish, but eventually it will have everlasting life for eternity. But that life only comes through Christ. Amen. Only through Christ. No other way. No other way. Let's close it up. Proverbs 16, 6. Last verse, look. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. And in these last few weeks, as we've been together, we have established that fear of failure, lack of belief, doubt, procrastinate. We've, we've went through so many rejection. That's evil, isn't it? But he says, and by the fear of the Lord, one will depart from that evil. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.